Good morning, my name is Guillaume Turc. I am an associate professor of neurology at the University of Paris and the current chairman of the guideline board of the European Stroke Organization. It is today my great pleasure to have the opportunity to discuss some key points of the new SO guideline on transient ischemic attack with the two chairs of the TIA module working group, Ana Catarina Fonseca from the University of Lisbon, Portugal and Onya Merwick from Cork University Hospital in Ireland. So, first of all, um, let's start with uh, services organization. Katarina, is it really necessary that patients suspected of TIA see a stroke specialist within 24 hours of stroke onset? Well, uh, yes, it is. Well, we know that pooled risk of stroke following a TIA at seven days is estimated to be 2% with top of the events occurring in the first 48 hours. So therefore, timely assessment and treatment of TIAs could help to prevent subsequent stroke and impact prognosis. So to answer this question, we performed a systematic literal review. We did not find any randomized controlled trials. We found three substantial studies that evaluated the effect of rapid assessment by a specialist of patients with TIA on subsequent stroke rates. Those studies were the SOS TIA, the registry and the express study. In the SOS TIA study, a total of about 1,000 suspected patients were included and 97% were followed up to determine stroke recurrence risk. And the median time from symptoms on to examination by a vascular neurologist was one day. When the sample was restricted to the patients that were seen within the first 24 hours of symptoms onset, the 90-day stroke rate was 1.63, and this stroke rate was lower than the risk predicted from the study participants' ABCT to score. It was 6.49. The express study, it was a substantial study that prospectively compared 90-day risk of recurrent stroke in TIA or minor stroke patients that were either seen in a study clinic by a specialist within a median time of three days in phase one, or within a median time of one day in phase two, the 90-day risk of recurrent stroke was 10% in phase one and 2% in phase two. And the TI residency project, a total of about 4,000 patients sought medical attention within 24 hours after symptoms onset, and 89% of these patients were examined by a stroke special within 24 hours. So therefore, in patients with the TIA, taking into account our happiness, we recommend special review of the patients within 24 hours after the onset of symptoms. Thank you so much for this um, very clear and detailed answer. Um, so several tools have been developed to estimate the risk of stroke following TIA, such as um, very popular ABCD2 score. Onya, what is uh, the evidence and the recommendation for primary care physicians to, to use such risk prediction tools to identify high-risk patients and also uh, to make triage decisions? The, um, the evidence regarding prediction tools comes from observational studies based on a meta-analysis performed by the TIA Guidelines Working Group. Good prediction properties for discrimination for high-risk patients were found for the ABCD2 prediction tool, for example, with a cut point of four. An ABCD2 score of four or more was associated with a threefold increased risk of stroke. The seven day stroke risk in ABCD2 category of three or less was 1.8, but in the high risk category, the stroke risk by seven days was over 5%. However, there's no randomized trial data, no direct comparison of use versus non use of prediction tools, and thus the evidence is graded as very low quality evidence. And there was limited availability of sensitivity and specificity data. So therefore, the guidelines make a weak recommendation regarding prediction tool use by primary care physicians. The guidelines suggest not to use prediction tools alone to identify high-risk patients or for triage and treatment decisions. Thank you. Katarina, is there a place for um, advanced imaging in patients with a suspected TIA? Well, that was one of the questions that we aim to answer. Uh, for patients who suspect TIA, this use of MRI, DWI, with PWI, or CT perfusion versus standard CT alone decreased stroke recurrence by actively identifying ischemic mechanism and for patients at high stroke risk. So we know that the fundamental standard for TIA diagnosis is clinical based, and therefore, a uh, lack of an ischemic fixture on error imaging does not exclude the TIA. However, agreement on clinical diagnosis and ischemic pathophysiology of transient neurological symptoms 
even among stroke specialists is low. So therefore, advanced imaging could help to identify footprints of the acute epochal fusion changes after transneurological symptoms. An infarction can be identified by MRI WI and focal epochal fusion, or CT perfusion, or MR PWI. A Twitter search that we did, however, did not identify any completed or randomized clinical trials comparing the different modalities. And the observational data in clinical series were identified. However, none of them directly evaluated if the strategy of using advanced imaging versus non contrast based CT was associated to a lower risk of stroke recurrence. And therefore, taking into account that evidence, there is insufficient evidence to provide a recommendation. However, we know that the presence of an acute positive WI lesion is an independent predictor of the risk of recurrent ischemic stroke. And also, that additional MRI sequences as to the star flare T1 may help in differential diagnosis of other causes of transneurological symptoms that may alter patient management, such as cerebral amyloid angiopathy with transit of focal neurological episodes, hemorrhage, tumors, inflammatory disorders, and many more. And CTP detects an acute or photo ischemic lesion in around 40% of the eye patients and does show comparable rates of abnormalities to perfusion MRI. So therefore, thinking to, to account these facts, we have added an expert consensus statement to the guideline. It says it inspected the patients to confirm an ischemic pathophysiologic of transneurological symptoms, where to enforce treatment, or if there is diagnostic uncertainty, we suggest to use MR, multimodal, or CT for perfusion, if feasible, instead of non-contrast CT. Thank you very much. Onya. Um, large, randomized trial, large randomized trials have demonstrated that dual antiplatelet therapy is beneficial in selected patients with TIA. What does the guideline recommend on this point, and should we favor clopidogrel or ticagrelor in addition to aspirin? The guidelines make a strong recommendation for dual antiplatelet therapy short term with aspirin and clopidogrel for patients with acute non cardioembolic high risk TIA high risk is defined as ABCD score of four or more. The recommendation for dual antiplatelet therapy is based on high quality evidence for meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials and accordingly less than 21 days of therapy. Compared with aspirin alone, dual antiplatelet therapy with clopidogrel and aspirin given within 24 hours after high risk TIA reduces all non-fatal recurrent stroke by about 19 and a thousand patients with a possible increase in moderate or severe extracranial bleeding of two per thousand. Today, regarding Tagacrelor, there's moderate quality evidence based on one dedicated randomized controlled trial. And dual antiplate with Tagacrelor and aspirin could be considered as an alternative regime in patients for whom clopidogrel and aspirin is not an option and who have intracranial or extracranial stenosis or an ABCD score of six or more. So the criteria used for the Chagaclor study was for very high risk TIA patients. Notably, there is a severe bleeding um, more frequently seen with Chagaclor and aspirin compared to aspirin alone. And so based on high quality evidence for clopidogrel and aspirin, it's just recommended by the guidelines for high risk non cardioembolic TIA for up to 21 days. Additionally, the guidelines do also provide an expert consensus statement with a suggestion to avoid dual antiplatelet therapy in low risk TIA or uncertain diagnosis, taking into account the bleeding risk and the absence of acute phase randomized clinical trial data for such patients. Thank you. This is very helpful for daily clinical practice. Are there situations in which aspirin may be given before brain imaging rules that ruled out an intracerebral hemorrhage? So in a scenario where a wait of more than 24 hours for neuroimaging is foreseen and a delay is judged to increase the risk of further ischemic events above the risk of starting antiplatelet medication, the guidelines suggest to start de novo aspirin monotherapy in such a situation. It is graded as low quality evidence it's based on indirect evidence from studies of aspirin monotherapy and stroke. Um, it comes from a meta-analysis of the data from 40,000 individual patients from the IST and CAST studies in that group of patients close to 
thousand stroke patients at the time who were randomized without a prior CT, but in within 48 hours of their stroke. And aspirin appeared to be of net benefit with no unusual excess risk of hemorrhage. So that scenario where brain imaging is delayed or foreseen to be a delay, and the available evidence suggests that the benefit of beginning antiplatelet therapy prior to brain imaging exceeds the risk. And recognizing that the greatest benefit of antiplatelet use is in that very early acute phase, the guidelines accordingly make a weak recommendation for what is termed de novo antiplatelet therapy, and specifically aspirin monotherapy, if the delay to imaging is anticipated. Many thanks, Katarina and Onya, for this very, very clear presentation, and congratulations uh, to the whole module working group for the great work on this guideline. Uh, the guideline will be published in the European Stroke Journal on March 16th. See you soon for a new video interview related to another ISO guideline.